I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. For months, the Greens have been piling pressure on the government to take much tougher action on soaring rents. The party's been demanding a national freeze or cap on what landlords can charge their tenants. On Friday, the Reserve Bank Governor shot down that idea. Philip Lowe, who's about to finish up in the role, said in the long run, capping rents will only make the housing crisis worse by driving out investment. He says more supply is the answer, and the Prime Minister agrees. On Wednesday, National Cabinet set to agree on steps to boost the number of homes being built. Renters' rights will also be discussed. It's looming as a critical meeting, both to help ease the housing crisis and the political pressure on Labor. Later, I'll be joined by the Nationals leader, David Littleproud. But first to the panel, Annabel Crabb, David Crow, and Sarah Eisen. Yeah. Good, morning. Good morning. And we're not going to steal too much thunder of uh, offsiders, which is uh, obviously going to be pouring <laughs> over the Matilda's result, but hopefully everyone's blood pressure has come down a little. Uh, yeah, although much. we've immediately launched into the national debate about whether there should be a public holiday for a match that hasn't even been won yet. We'll get to that. It's <laughs> I love coming that. for sure, though. Yeah. No one's in any doubt. Uh, let's start on housing, though. And... Um, Annabelle, Wednesday's meeting, the semi-final will be Wednesday night, <laughs> no, no, no. Wednesday's National Cabinet meeting, uh, what can we expect, do you think? Well, I think we... I, I, I think... I think we are unlikely to expect a national rent capping scheme, um, no matter what the um, Greens are arguing for. I mean, look, this is an opportunity for um, Anthony Albanese, flanked by his mainly Labor um, Premier colleagues and Chief Minister colleagues, to um, come up with what looks like a national plan that is going to do something for renters and do something for affordable housing, given that he can't seem to get his plan through the Senate at the moment. And I think that the most likely outcome is a suite of measures that, that does um, address supply. Because, like, even here we're in the People's Republic of Canberra, which is the only... Uh, area of Australia where the there rent are control. rental yeah. controls. Just explain to people that's uh, the ACT has, um, you're only allowed to put up rents, uh, what is it, 110% of CPI right. of inflation. Yep. So they go up by inflation a little bit more each year and that's it. And as a result, renting in the ACT is massively cheap, as everybody <laughs> knows. I mean, it's brilliant. But even Andrew Barr, you know, who is the author of this administered scheme, does not make huge claims for the efficacy of the rental cap, right? Like he says, it's a it's a part of a suite of measures. And in I think including that... Including supply. Mm. Yeah. And even this government here in the ACT, which has got Greens as part of the government, doesn't impose rent caps, which is the Greens, Greens, which is what the Greens are calling on the government to do. Isn't that a rent cap, though? What they're doing? Oh, it's oh, sorry, rent freeze. Oh, yeah. right. Rent freeze. So there is also this idea that you freeze rents. The Greens did this costing through the parliamentary library, or received this costing from the parliamentary library, showing that Australian renters would have saved three billion in the last year mm. if there'd been a rent freeze. But, of course, we're going into this meeting on Wednesday. There's no momentum at state and federal level for something as sweeping as a rent freeze. Right. And and we saw what the RBA governor said about that. And so we're... Well, just, just, we I'll, I'll show you what the Reserve Bank Governor said that you mentioned. He was Philip Lowe. And it's interesting because he's not just having a crack at the idea of um, capping rents. He also has a go at the idea of throwing money at home buyers to yeah. help them buy into the market. Have a look. When housing prices were rising quickly, people were saying, well, we need to give people more money to help with them. And when rents are rising quickly, people say we need to kind of cap the rent increases. So they're short-term fixes that both of them, in my judgment, make the problem worse. Yeah, so, sorry to interrupt you, David, there, but he's really having a go at governments that but also... But it's crucial, isn't it? Because we've been going through years of argument uh. about various federal schemes where politicians stand in front of a house mm -hmm. being built and say, here's our scheme to help you buy a home. Mm. And guess what? At the last election, Labor went to the election saying, we've got a help to buy policy. Equity scheme. They haven't even legislated that yet. They haven't even put the draft legislation before the parliament. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing... versions of that policy, which we've known forever, is inflationary on... Push-up price. Yeah, but we still keep doing it. But so, now the message is it's all about supply. And I think the deadlock in the Senate over the Housing Australia Future Fund, a $10 billion fund to invest in social housing, I think that debate's going to be dwarfed by this bigger debate mm. about supply, so what about are they planning sure? and zoning. What do they do? I mean, you can't fix everything in one meeting, but where are we heading on Wednesday, do you think, when it comes to supply? What are the states going to agree I mean, to? I definitely think that Dave was just touching on it, the, the deregulation, the, the planning, is mm. how do we get faster unlocking of land and yep. that sort of thing, which is interesting. Um, definitely the freezers being off the table. We've already heard Chris Minns, New South Wales Premier, ruling that out, so you can't have this kind of national plan that the, the Greens are very much calling for. Uh, but trying to get a, a quicker 
um, and more efficient unlocking of land so you can build property, I think, is one of the biggest things on there. And that's something the PM is saying, it's this sort of national coordination. You talk to people in the government, they're saying, look, we can't force the states to do anything. At the same time, we don't want to take a camera example. In Queanbeyan, you know, you've got this kind of, you know, situation for your rents or how much they go up and you drive 20 minutes over here mm. to Canberra and it's this situation. Yeah. We want this national so coordination. Ham ham if you have a look yeah. at the New South Wales situation, right, like there's dead hulk buildings everywhere that, that have developers going broke because the bummers falling out of apartment prices. You have like the lowest um, rate of housing, new housing approvals in like a significant period of time. Like it's a very complicated question because you, you can't get builders, you know, actually building something. Construction costs are rising. Right? Yeah. I mean, so there's this huge demand and rents are increasing, but also you've got not only a neutral supply situation, mm. but a, a negative. And, um, and you've got a hard situation. forecast for a shortage. Yeah. You know, there's a hard forecast for a shortage yep. in the next couple of years. At the same time, the builders are going bankrupt. Yeah. And uh, co construction costs are going up. And, and it's hard population's to growing. Uh, yeah. with right. population's growing. High better. migration. High and, migration. Is but, like, in Sydney, you've got all these empty buildings in the middle of the city because um, all of these big firms have downsized mm. their work-from-office workforce. I mean, surely it's time to employ a bit of imaginative thinking about how you can repurpose all of that space mm. in the inner city mm. that... Um, isn't going to be used as office I mean, space. Yes, again. you're right, and some of that's happening, but it's it's not going to you know, fill all of the uh, demand that's that's there. You then get yeah. this issue with and imagine the infill. delicious approvals process that that will involve. <laughs> yeah. But the, yeah. well, it, it comes to what I think both Chris Minns and Dan Andrews in Victoria are talking about, and that's more medium density mm -hmm. infill. Um, we know for decades this has been politically difficult. Mm. Um, you know, NIMBYism and so on in, in, in suburbs that have long resisted uh, more density in, in their neck of the woods. How difficult is that going to be? For I think immensely difficult because it's easy to come out of a National Cabinet uh, meeting and say, we've got a commitment on zoning and planning and supply. But at the local level, you've got resistance to cluster housing next to quarter acre blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so and there's and got to be this argument seats. that not in my backyard, turns around to yes in my backyard, mm. the NIMBYs get outflanked by the YIMBYs or whatever. <laughs> but, I mean, can that actually be done? Political leaders have to persuade the community mm. that that is actually necessary for equity in society because of the affordability problem with housing. And I think that's, that's an immense challenge once they emerge from the National Cabinet you, meeting on Wednesday. Do you think it's still, uh, with that challenge, I mean, right now I feel like every day we're hearing about this, this housing crisis and how everyone's struggling, renters, you know, mortgage um, owner, uh, owners and so on. Everyone's having a really hard time. So if people are hearing that every day and you do have a state or a local government going about these things in that context, does that sort of, you know, like prime the, the ground to actually saying, yep, look, they're big high-rise or they're big buildings, but as we know... This, we're, we're in a crisis and we need to and address it. And the other it. Point, Especially important for younger voters. Yes. yes political leaders know they've got to appeal to those young yeah, voters. And the other, the other point is a lot of renters um, are just nowhere near being able to afford, even no. if there's more supply, yeah. nowhere near being able to afford to buy. Um, and there's some polling from Redbridge that points this out, about half can't afford yep. anything over 500 grand. So they'd struggle to get into the market even mm. if all this extra supply comes on. This is why the Greens are really going after mm. action on rents and the acting leader, Maureen Faruqi, Yes, this is a state responsibility, but she doesn't see that as a problem at all. The Prime Minister was boasting just a couple of days ago um, that he could uh, get the states to sign on to a new public holiday. The Prime Minister absolutely has the power and the jurisdiction to be able to coordinate states and territories to then implement rent freezes and rent caps. In fairness, I think it's a little easier to, <laughs> to get agreement on a public holiday like, for the The Matildas. truth is that... I mean, the axiomatic rule about political arguments is if you've got the simpler bumper sticker argument, then you're going to win it. And that's what's happening with the Greens at the moment with renters. They are winning the argument because they are saying, hey, we care about you. You tend to be overlooked in all this other policy making, but we can see that your rents are out of control mm -hmm. and here's what we're proposing to do about it. Very simple bumper yeah. sticker. And actually more complicated than it sounds, yeah. but, I mean, it is politically... That's politics. It's Appealing. super, super powerful. And yeah. the Prime Minister doesn't want to give the Greens any credit for anything yeah. they can do on housing, but how much pressure is he feeling, do you think? Heaps. Quite a lot. You can see, you know, well, Max and so on getting under... Uh, Chandler Mayer, the, the Greens uh, housing spokesman, really getting under his skin. You well, he's in basically... QT, don't you? Yes. It's personal. It yeah. feels but very it's, personal. But it's a personal contest that sums up a very significant political 
challenge to mm. Labor about that forces it to act more quickly and at greater scale. And, and the Greens, at, you know, they've, they've campaigned on climate in the past, on refugees on the past, mm. now it's about renters. It's a major plank of their election strategy for the next election. A third of people are renters, I think that's roughly the number. However, I haven't Growing seen... Growing contingent. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big base. I haven't seen results so far that show the Greens are on an upsurge in their primary vote. We've seen polling showing that Labor's surged since the election, but not so far the Greens. So I'm, I'm still curious out so far on the impact for the Greens in lifting their support, well, but that's clearly the strategy. I think it's a huge pressure on the PM, though, because essentially... Let's face it, Max Chan Lamar is pretty much young Albanese. Like, <laughs> it's pretty so. much yeah. university Albanese yeah. <laughs> before he... I, I call them both young Turks because... And, and in fact, Max Chan Lamar has started in the Labor left, mm. just like Anthony Albanese did. He's chosen a different path since then. But um, there are similarities. And I mean, this has been not... It's been a long time coming, maybe, you know, only a couple of years, two or three, but Max, a couple of years ago, before he even had this seat, was addressing rooms full of Greens, saying, renters, this is where we get to it. This is our 18-year plan to get a Greens government. 18 years. 18, wow. 18 years. That, was, that was the plan. And this He's is, only young. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and this is, this is what we're going to do. And he and it, the, the Greens co the the uh, renters' cohort was identified, and that was even before the last election when their primary votes surged, as this is how we're going to do it. And it was a plank before this all blew up like it has in terms of the housing crisis in the last 12 months. So it's right. been kind of in the making for a while. Yeah. Well, uh, time now to talk to the Nationals leader, David Littleproud, and to take us there. One of the other cost of living battles that was going on during the week, the government's making medicines cheaper for those with chronic conditions by allowing them to fill 60-day scripts rather than just 30 days. The opposition, though, is worried about the impact on pharmacies. We think it's great policy. We just want to see it implemented right. We want to see it implemented in a way that Australians um, aren't worse off and that pharmacies don't close. Because if pharmacies close, Australians will be worse off. There have been twice as many applications for new pharmacies to be opened, which require government approval, twice as many applications for new pharmacies since I announced this measure as there were in the same period last year. So clearly this sort of massive hit to business confidence that the pharmacy lobby and coalition uh, have claimed would happen is not being reflected in investment in the pharmacy sector. If they want to make medicines cheaper, which we support, then it's a measure that should be funded. At the moment, the way the government structured it, the pharmacists are going to have to pick up that, and I don't think patients want that. David Littleproud, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, can you just clear this one up for us? Is this a great policy, as Anne Rustin was saying there, or do you think taxpayers should instead be footing the bill, as, as Peter Dutton seems to be suggesting? Yeah, we all want cheaper medicines, but we've got to appreciate this is a fundamental change to the way that medicines are paid for. You've got to appreciate, in this country, the type of medicines and the price of those medicines is regulated. And so to make sure that there was a business model that, that mum and dad chemists and pharmacists around the country undertook, is they were paid an $8 dispensing fee. And so if you change that business model by going from 30 to 60 a days, then that has a fundamental change on those small businesses, and particularly for those young ones that have just got into to this. Uh, they now have a lot of debt with their house, uh, houses and employees that they have to pay for and those at retirement have just seen their asset, their superannuation, which is their business, dwindle away without proper consultation. And so what we're saying is this is an opportunity to sit down and get this right because of the unintended consequences, particularly for us in regional Australia. You've got to understand there's over 400 pharmacies that is the last line of primary care for rural and remote Australians. If they leave, uh, then we have nothing. And let me tell you that if they stay, they're not probably going to be able to sell it to anybody because no one's going to want to go out there and start up a pharmacy. So this is the challenge where we just think the government uh, should stop, should pause and should talk to the pharmacists. There are ways through this uh, and the Pharmacy uh, Guild has been trying to engage with the government to get a common sense solution around a phase-in about shared risk, shared responsibility on this. But the unintended consequence, unfortunately, is us in rural and regional Australia. Uh, it's our well-being. This isn't about politics. This is actually about our well-being. We've already seen our doctors being ripped out of us because of the change of foreign doctors being allowed to, to work outside rural and remote areas. And now if we lose this, we lose our last line of primary care. There will be. There will be perverse health outcomes. And I fear uh, regional and rural Australians' lives will be put at risk.
Well, uh, I'll, I'll come to that risk that you talk about there, but you also referred to shared responsibility in that answer. Can I just be, be clear on this? Are you saying taxpayers should be compensating pharmacists, paying, uh, paying some of the tab here? Well, we already are, David, and when we uh, looked to actually uh, make sure that we took cost of living pressure off childcare, we didn't ask for childcare providers to pay for that in terms of the subsidies that were provided. But I think what uh, the Guild and pharmacists in general have been asking for is common sense solution of sharing that risk about how we get to a model uh, whereby it, there is actually levers, policy levers, are like scope of practice, that allows pharmacists to do more and, and what they're actually trying to do at university See, that just makes sense. And that actually requires some support from the states. And, and credit where credit's due, I think Mark Butler has grabbed that baton, but we need to continue to accelerate that because that then opens up the business model for pharmacists to be able to continue uh, to, to have other income streams. Otherwise, they go into things like Webster packs right. that have a perverse outcome for, for aged care and Indigenous Australians. So this is where the government, we're saying to them, over the next three weeks, please, put the arms down, let's not fight with the, the Guild, let's sit in a room and let's get a phasing model with shared risk, shared responsibility and options to make sure that we have a viable pharmacy sector. These are mum and dad businesses. These aren't big corporations. These are mum and dad businesses. And for us in the bush, these are, in many cases, our last line of primary care. Okay. So not, not necessarily government paying that dispensing fee, but giving pharmacists the ability to take on more other work, like prescribing medicines. I think there can be a mixture of both, Dave, and I think there's there's another pharmacy agreement that's due in the, in the government, the eighth pharmacy uh, agreement. That could be brought forward, sitting around the table, but working through and understanding there's opportunities uh, to share that risk, share that cost burden. But it's it's like childcare. We didn't ask childcare providers to pay for the $4.7 billion worth of subsidies, but oh. you're asking mum and dad businesses to have to bear that cost okay. just, uh, and at an arbitrary yeah. date of the 1st of September. Just before we move on, this will take effect now for from 1st of September. Parliament won't sit until after that. So um, just to clarify, will, will you seek to reverse this when Parliament's back and push medicine prices back up? If, if the government hasn't sat down and worked with the pharmacies around how they can actually work through this and, and phase this in a responsible way that protects the business model of pharmacists that actually made business decisions predicated on the model that we have here where prices of medicines are regulated and that $8 was, was part of that business model, that they've made investment decisions. They've made employment decisions of, of people that they're employing today that. predicated but off that. You, you would, and they you have would put those to medicine pay. prices so this is back up for... Um, I mean, what would you say to someone with diabetes or Parkinson's? You're willing to put their price back up? David, we, we would rather not have to have to go back to the parliament, but unfortunately the government hasn't sat down with the Guild in a constructive way in which they've tried to engage in. And we're saying to them, please, this is above politics. This is about the well-being the well-being of people, particularly in rural and remote Australia, that may have nothing. Right. And I get it might sound great to have a few dollars in your pocket living in Canberra and you can run from one suburb to the next to see a pharmacist. But just think in some of my towns that I represent, they could be four, 500 kilometres away from any primary care, uh, let alone uh, get cheaper medicine. Mm. So we're just saying, please, this is an opportunity for political leadership, for political courage and common sense. Let's uh, turn to um, renewable energy. I'm keen for your thoughts on the, the, the growing concern in the regions uh, amongst farmers in particular about the impact of transmission lines um, that are required for big wind and solar projects. Um, the government's acknowledged the need for better consultation. It's, it's uh, just commissioned a review into how um, communities are being consulted uh, about these transmission projects. Bottom line, though, if we're going to have all these renewables, we're going to need all of this transmission. So what's the solution here? Well, it's, it's to pause and to plan properly and to understand there's a place for renewables, uh, particularly if you want to look at solar. Um, if, you want to, if you want to put that into the concentration of population where it's required the most, then why wouldn't you put that on rooftops rather than on prime agricultural land or ripping down remnant vegetation? Uh, we're ripping down remnant vegetation not just for solar and for, for wind towers, but also the 28,000 kilometres of new transmission lines to plug all this in. Uh, and that is a 
perverse outcome where we're destroying the very thing that this policy is meant to protect. Even, even when we're looking at pumped hydros at Yungala outside Mackay or Barumba outside Gympie, uh, that's going to destroy remnant vegetation, pristine rainforest of platypus uh, just for a pumped hydro. So what's the answer? Knocking down I mean, the habitat of, of if, 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 are you saying you're opposed well, to large scale renewable projects now, the, the big wind and solar farms? No, what I'm saying, David, is we've got the time to pause and to plan instead of this reckless race to 83% renewables by 2030. Uh, that has meant that basically everything's been thrown out the window, even EISs. Effectively, it's just slash and burn to get this in. Uh, so what we're saying is there's an opportunity to pause and to plan to get this right and to look at other alternatives. Because, you know, the only international commitment we have to meet is that of net zero by 2050. It's not by 2030 by what this government is taking us down. So we have the opportunity to, to look at the alternatives. And in fact, there are a number of professors out of Victoria University, Bruce Mountain uh, and, and Simon Bartlett, who actually believe there are opportunities where renewables and an energy mix, along with carbon capture storage, and, and you even see today that the Biden administration is going to invest $1.2 billion into uh, investing into, into carbon capture storage. If we get back to first principles of reducing emissions, we can protect traditional industries, we can have well, renewables okay. as part but there, of that, but we can also look at the emerging zero emissions technology of small-scale modular nuclear. All right, there are plenty of others, though, who say we do need to get cracking, uh, including our existing energy market operators. Um, when you say pause, are you saying we should pause on the net zero by 2050 target as well, or are you still, for the record, committed to that? Yeah, that's the policy of the National Party. The party, party room, National Party Party Room has made it clear that we made a commitment to net zero, but we made a commitment to get there by 2050, knowing that there was an arbitrary line of, of, of that achievement, that technology would solve much of this. And so what we're saying is not saying we have to pause for years or generations. It's about actually sitting down. One of the first things I did when I became the leader of the Nationals was write to Anthony Albanese and say, let's have a National Energy Summit. Let's, as political leaders, come together with unions, with industry, with the energy sector itself, and let's plan this properly. Let's look at the emerging technology that we can cast our mind to, particularly here in this country, where we have sovereignty of all our resources, that we can look over the horizon and make sure we're making the right investments without the unintended consequences. So we're not saying let's put this on pause forever. We're saying let's just use some common sense. And I thought that it was an opportunity for political leadership, not just for me, but for, for Peter Dutton and for Anthony Albanese, to, to come forward and to look at solutions like emerging technology in net, in net zero small scale modular nuclear. And, and we didn't do it for the nine years we are in government because while the nationals have believed in this emerging technology, the liberals weren't. And it, it's taken the courage of Peter Dutton to come with us to have that conversation. And I, and I congratulate him for that. But why wouldn't we let the market decide, but let's educate Australians. This isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, this is something that we need to bring them on that journey. And that's why I wanted to have some political leadership from across the aisle and say, let's have a National Energy Summit. Let's uh, let Australians bring them into our trust and let them decide what our energy mix should look like while living up to our international commitments. Well, you and others, uh, you mentioned their nuclear power, you and others in the coalition have been uh, sounding a lot more keen on the idea of, of nuclear power and building them on old coal-fired uh, plants, um, in particular these small modular reactors. How many of those do you think Australia would need? Well, and I think this is where this National Energy Summit, sitting down and planning and making sure we get it right, will understand. I actually think that there's an opportunity for us to show that courage, but we don't have to spend a cent on it. We don't have to spend $2 billion like we're going to spend on hydrogen, which a couple of billionaires will get advantage of and, and walk away with. We can actually peek over the Pacific, see what happens, and we can adopt and adapt if we want. And this is where there needs to be proper planning, and this is where this reckless race to get to this target by 2030 is but, having the unintended yeah, consequences also where need renewables to be, are losing their social licence. Uh, well, I also need to be clear about um, what nuclear would mean. These small modular reactors are defined as a reactor that can provide up to 300 megawatts. Uh, a a coal-fired yep. power plant can be 2,000 megawatts. Some estimates suggest you need 80 of these nuclear plants. Is that something you'd consider? 
No, David, I think this is where uh, where people like Chris Bowen are conflating. And, you know, most coal-fired power stations that are left now are around 1,200 megawatt. Now, if you're going to bring renewables in, and you do that in a sensible way in the right environment, and you plug these into where existing coal-fired power stations are, uh, then you also alleviate the need for the 28,000 kilometres of new transmission lines, which takes away a significant cost. So this is where you have the opportunity. And I think you'll see even before an SMR is put in, I think you'll see if we were had the courage to open up, you'll see microgrids where industry themselves, like big smelters, can bring in even ones that are around three to five megawatt, and that allows them to actually um, bring down their costs and have a reliable energy source because the nuclear energy burns at a higher heat, greater efficiency, so it means it's a it's greater advantage for our manufacturing sector. But these are the conversations mm. we should cheap, be having though, now they? because this isn't going to happen. Well, NOR's renewables, David, when you've got to plug in 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines and you're destroying natural yeah. habitat to plug them all in. So let's have, let's have a, a, an honest conversation. Even the Gen Cost report that Chris Bowen was brandishing around fails to acknowledge the 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines. This is why we should take the politics out of this, have a national energy summit, bring the experts in, and I may be proved wrong. But I've got the courage of my conviction to stand forward as a political leader in this courage, country and say, let's actually try and work this out together so that we can, we can move forward together right. with what we should have is reliable, cheap energy that's reducing our emissions. A couple of other things on the voice to parliament. Uh, David Littleproud, what's wrong with listening to Indigenous Australians when designing laws that affect them? Well, nothing, David, but it's the mechanism that's been put in place. This isn't something new that um, the, the Prime Minister's put in place in The Voice. He's saying this is something brand new. This isn't. We've done this before. We had a representative body before. It was called ATSIC. So what, what's and wrong with... Well, it's a little bit different. ATSIC had the power to actually allocate funding and run programs. This, this is an advisory body. It, no, it, it, again, David, the problem comes from the lived experience we have, and it might work in, in suburbs, in, in capital cities, but when you're talking about representative bodies in rural and remote Australia, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of square kilometres, hundreds of different diverse communities that have different challenges and different needs. Hmm. So what's wrong, what's, what's wrong with listening to them? What's wrong with listening to them? Well, nothing, David, and that's why I'm saying there needs to be a 2023 intervention. That intervention needs to be with the bureaucracy. We don't need a bigger bureaucracy, we need a better one. Where we know, to the, to the postcode, the disadvantage and where the gap hasn't closed. So this isn't about generalising and bringing representatives to Canberra and saying this is what it is, and then the bureaucrats generalise a national program that has no buy-in by a local community. What works is empowering local elders in local communities, because invariably but isn't that, they're the isn't ones that what's that being talked about about here, community. listening to those local voices through a national no, but, voice. No, so, but sadly, David, what we've got is you're going to have 24 representatives, two from each state, and then you'll have regional representatives that will be covering hundreds of thousands of square kilometres that, that with hundreds of different diverse communities. And this is the mistake we made last time with a representative body. This is about making sure that we do things differently, not repeat the mistakes of well, the past, to, despite just, what the I Prime Minister is saying. This is a misinformation here. It's different to ATSIC. This is, this is an advisory body, not, no, like, not like ATSIC. Just, just finally, with the Nationals David, support... Where the money's getting spent. Oh, with the national support legislating a voice? Well, that's something that, that my party room would have to work through in the details. You don't have a view on that? Obviously, we've got great concern. Well, personally, I have a real concern about going back to regional models because what it means to us in regional remote areas is hundreds of thousands of square kilometres, right. not 20 square kilometres across a couple of suburbs. So you're this at odds with Peter Dutton on that. You, you, you don't support legislating a voice. Well, that's OK. I, I, I'm, the, I'm in the National Party, if, and if the National Party doesn't get comfort with that, that's what we stand for. But so under the coalition, should you win view, the election, we, we may not get any sort of legislated voice? Well, there'll be a change in how we're doing things at the moment, David, but that's something that my party room, and it's not my decision to make in isolation, mm -hmm. that's the primacy of my party room, and we'll work through it from the lived experience that we have okay. from representing rural and remote Australia and making sure that we get their interests uh, heard in, in what that policy setting will look right. like. But we'll be constructive in any negotiations with anybody. Just a final one on a more positive note, uh, David Littleproud. Should the Matildas make it all the way to the World Cup and win the final... Uh, will you support the Prime Minister's call for a national public holiday? 
Yeah, my crate night, I'm still, uh, I didn't get much sleep. I, my blood pressure didn't come down to let me go to sleep. But uh, look, I don't want to be Captain Killjoy on this, but look, I, I think business has a, has a point here. Uh, it's easy to call for a national holiday when, holiday when someone else is paying for it. Uh, I'm proud of the, the Matildas, and I think every Australian is, and we're going to be riding at home every, on Wednesday but a, but night a and then no hopefully to the next public uh, Sunday night. I think we've just got to understand that someone's got to foot that bill and, and businesses out there are doing it tough. Uh, we're, we live in a great nation. We can celebrate our wins, but we've got to get on and pay the bills and, and make sure that uh, the, the country keeps going. All right, David Little Proud, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, mate. All right, coming up, Kevin Rudd's portrait. The uh, former Prime Minister, now Ambassador to the United States, had his official portrait unveiled during the week and had some serious warnings, too, about the risk of war in our region. We're going to get to that. First, let's continue this conversation. Back to our panel, Annabelle Crabb, David Crowe and Sarah Ison. Gee, a couple of things uh, interesting at, at the end there. Um, no to the public holiday. Brave, <laughs> brave political move. But what Particularly if taxpayers so... subsidise the public holiday? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Would the political you know, party support a... You know, a la the uh, the health uh, the the pharmacy dispute at the moment. You know, a bigger subsidy, maybe uh, you get a public holiday. Um, and uh, this idea of legislating the voice mm. has been Peter Dutton's. You know, don't vote yes in the referendum. We will legislate a voice. Maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not. Because that's that thing is Peter Dutton really being stronger on that as of this weekend because he's trying to sort of hit back at the government saying this is a once in a generation opportunity saying well maybe if this sort of model doesn't work if the coalition comes back we can do a legislative thing and that's why you should vote for us and then you've got the leader of the junior party of the saying coalition no, saying probably not. No. Well I mean it leaves this question right if, if for Australians weighing up what to do in this referendum wondering if some sort of body like the voice might be the go if it doesn't get up at this referendum. What maybe do you have? That, what that's do you it. have? I mean the What's the Liberal Party position? Back in April when they had their party room meeting, they talked about national, local and regional voices. Mm. Since then, hardly any... Uh, Peter Dutton doesn't talk about a national legislated voice, even well, though that was the expectation of some of his Liberal colleagues back then. I think some still talk about a national legislated voice, but now it's a mystery. So if, mm. if their position is vote no, well, what have they got instead to close well, the gap? Because none of the structural concerns that um, the opposition has with the constitutional voice is obviated by just le legislating it. Mm. I mean, all of the design critiques would presumably still be there. I mean, look, it's one of these situations where a piece of key government policy is delivering the opposition more joy about discussing it than it is the government. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's... Every week you see um, an expansion of the discussion of the voice and what it will be and what it could be, etc., that is driven by the opposition, mm. broadening out the likely powers or threats of it um, what beyond comes what the, or... the government. I want to come about. Uh, let's but come also, back to can this. I just quickly say, yeah. I also love to see a uh, national party leader uh, discuss why a particular group of Australians shouldn't have a voice to Parliament, given that that's essentially what the national party is. Right. Well, <laughs> indeed. I want to talk about the position on medicines, though, because it was pretty confusing. I thought during the week. I do think David Little Pratt had a clearer, um, uh, well prescription, uh, shall we say, of, of what, well what, thank you, what needs to happen here in terms of um, helping the pharmacists, not necessarily with direct taxpayer mm. funds, but giving them more scope to do other stuff, uh, you know, build a, a, a better revenue base in return for um, the hit that they are going to take, particularly in the regions, uh, through this change. What do, you, what do you reckon? But that's already underway. I mean, I think in New South Wales and Queensland and I think Victoria... There are trials now of pharmacists being able to prescribe Section 4 drugs, you know, stuff like the pill or um, medication for UTIs or whatever, which, you know, is really controversial amongst doctors yeah, and yeah. also creates this situation doctors where... Doctors hate this stuff, but yeah. I, I assume right, he's talking also, about going beyond that. Right? But also, but I mean, like, that is a huge growth yeah. in the business model for pharmacies, which is why people are still, you know, opening them. You've got you know, the situation where the pharmacist is like, oh, Mrs Brown, yes, you do seem to have a urinary tract infection. Uh, I can write you a prescription, which I'm also dispensing from, <laughs> you know, desk number B. I mean, it's kind of a big change. And it was done by Liberals in New South Wales, yep. now embraced by Labor. Yep. So there's a bipartisan element to that. So, but look... When a political leader says this is not about politics, <laughs> just assume it's about politics. I mean, the, the appeal from the coalition here 
is to the small business owners of the pharmacies. Yep. Mm. They're fighting, or we're fighting for you. Mm. You know, we're fighting for you to get a better deal out of this. But at the moment, it looks like they're blocking something that would actually save consumers $180 a year. And I think that's a very awkward position for the coalition to be putting themselves in. It starts from September 1. You only have to go to the pharmacy every 60 days rather than every 30 days. This covers 300 medicines. There's three stages, so it's a far-reaching change. Um, and, oh, it's so heavy, and it's immensely popular. When we polled, 72% of people right. like so it. Yes, please. Uh, yes. I'd like cheaper and medicines. So I think here the issue is for pharmacies. The problem for them is their business model assumes customers have to go back every 30 days. But the cu consumer benefit is to go back less often. Customers and want that. If your so business you model is based on something that customers don't want to do, you've got a problem. So it means and the taxpayer can't always subsidise you. Well, we wound up that. with this situation on Thursday where the coalition, uh, and you, you could kind of hear it there, right? They, they're having a bit both ways. They, they like the idea of cheaper medicines. They don't want the pharmacies to, to lose out. So they moved this disallowance motion, then they pulled it back and now, you know, David Littleproud saying we want to bring it back in again when, when Parliament returns. Mm. It was all a little confusing or indeed amusing if, if you're the Prime Minister. They lost six votes trying to block the vote being held. <laughs> trying to block the vote being held on their motion. <laughs> on their motion. And then Order. when that all failed... They withdrew the moving of the motion. Oh. So now it sits on the notice paper an orphan. <laughs> no one's moving it. No one's associated with it. Order. What a farce. Bottom line, uh, this change will take effect from September 1. Do you really think the, the, the Coalition will try and jack those prices back up again? I think in a... Uh, um intense cost of living environment mm. it would be an unusual thing to see the opposition militating for a doubling you can of see what the PM prices. will do if they right. do right you yeah of course sense of it and I think the kindest way you could put this would be to say that the um, exercise in this last couple of days of parliament did not display sort of Barbary sheep degree of political short-footedness right <laughs> and you could see that the coalition didn't want to end the week you know voting for more expensive medicines. But more broadly, I think it's so interesting. I don't understand the shape of what the coalition's doing at the moment. I mean, you know, the 2022 election, they lost a lot of professional women voters, right? Mm. Like, that's a mm. huge dent that happened. Mm. And if you look at who is going to... Who is taking a break in their lunch break to run into the pharmacy to get grandma's heart pills or pick up prescriptions for kids or whatever. Like, it's women who are, like, doing more of that. Mm. I don't understand how this forms part of the coalition's to pitch to that demographic. Or older voters as well. Mm. The people right? who most often yeah. go back to the pharmacy to get regular scripts for all yeah. manner of pills that they need. Yeah now have Maybe the chance to go back less often and save money. Maybe so they'll be massively into nuclear power. <laughs> <laughs> Even if like, they do... I think it's an unlikely thing for the Coalition to keep fighting on. I think most people will just ignore or forget or not even see this Senate shenanigans. Mm. The bottom line is that the Coalition, um, I think, just cannot afford to block something that save cons saves consumers money. Even if they do try to bring on this disallowance motion again, I mean, it can be... It's just probably posturing, right? Because you can see the numbers. Right. It's not going to happen, even mm. if just one of the crossbenchers votes with the yeah, they government. Don't, they don't have enough numbers. Exactly. So, in, on another side, I suppose you could do a bit of posturing for whatever agenda or gain you'd, you'd yeah, want to do. Yeah, but you're going to get smashed up by the PM. Yeah, yeah. but the yeah. Pharmacy yeah. Guild will know who's fighting for them. All right, look, one of the big moments of the week in Parliament House, of course, was the unveiling of this, the, uh, the portrait, the Prime Minister portrait of Kevin Rudd. Uh, there he is, much anticipated, uh, now of course ambassador to the United States. And look, much like his time as PM, there's a lot going on <laughs> in this uh, painting. We've got the game of chess, you've got the um, cat, you've got a, a large and intelligent looking book, you've got some Chinese vases, you've got some Indigenous art. Um, it's like a magic eye painting. You just can't <laughs> stop looking at it. And the longer you look at it, the more questions arise. You know, is the cat winning this chess <laughs> game? Uh, what, yeah, what is the cat? Who is the cat? Um, let's the get some. Called Louis. Let's get some critical analysis on the uh, on the work of art. It, look, it is different to most of those portraits people would be familiar with in Parliament House of former PMs because there's so much else 
going on mm -hmm. uh, in, in the frame. Yeah, I mean, if you look at even Julia Gillard, um, her portrait is very much a big close-up. She really dominates yep. this entire frame and it's enormous. This one, exactly as Annabelle was saying, you can keep looking at it and keep finding things. And I think people did that all day on the unveiling and will continue to do that, particularly the chessboard in the front. I think a number of my colleagues were going, wonder who's winning this chess game. <laughs> there seems a queen who's well-placed. What does the queen represent? A certain other maybe mm. female and the prime bishop minister? Seems to be the there. bishop could be out of play and so people are getting really into Look, it. I'm just disappointed there weren't any of the uh, hand gestures that Annabelle you used to write about so uh, <laughs> Red spider. brilliantly. Red spider. Red spider. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> on a more serious... get away with um, hands cupping the breasts of an invisible uh, peasant girl yeah. but um, only once and that was many years yeah, right, ago. Okay. I'd never get away with it now. On a more, on a more serious <laughs> note, um, the, the now ambassador did uh, issue a, a fairly serious warning while he was at the event about what's going on in this region and the real risk of war. We are in a region where the risk of crisis, conflict and war is real. Not a theory, it's a real threat. And this requires our democracies to navigate our security circumstances with a level of care, intention and foresight and with hard decisions to be made. The, um, the Prime Minister, by the way, David, has now locked in a date for his official visit to Washington, uh, where he'll meet Joe Biden at the White House October 25, which of course also indicates the voice referendum will happen uh, before then. But the sort of things he'll talk about in Washington, obviously what Kevin Rudd's talking about there with uh, AUKUS um, you know, now uh, in, in train, um, those warnings are very serious. What do you think is going to be on the agenda specifically for that state visit? That visit uh, includes a state dinner where uh, the Prime Minister will be meeting at the White House with all manner of people in Washington DC, not just the President. And of course one of the big things on the agenda is making sure Congress approves the sale of nuclear submarines to Australia. Because that's, a, you know, that's contentious enough in Australia, also contentious in America because it's not something they've done yep. with anybody before. And he'll be hoping that's done by the time he gets there. He, he needs to be able to maintain good relations with a lot of people in Congress, not just with the United States President. Of course, you've got to hedge your bets when you've got a presidential election coming up. Uh, but it's about get, getting that approval and closening the ties with those member, we members of Congress who, some of them, including Mike Gallagher, um, good friend of Australia in Congress, wants us to have much more firepower in Australia. And this is another contentious thing. Well, Things I'll, just like on that, I'll show you that. Yep, more because he's, I've got a bit of that here. Mike Gallagher... Um, He's a leading Republican congressman. He's in Australia at the moment with a bunch of other members of Congress for the Australia-America Leadership Dialogue. He's chair of the Friends of AUKUS committee in Congress. I mean, he and everyone has been saying, look, don't worry, this will get through Congress. They'll approve the submarine deal. It's just, you know, part of the, how the sausage is made getting this uh, legislation through. But, yeah, to your point about where AUKUS is heading beyond submarines, uh, here are some comments he made to my colleague Greg Jennett about... Um, long-range missiles being based in northern Australia. If you believe there's a serious risk that Xi Jinping could attempt to take Taiwan by force, the best way to prevent that is to put hard power in his path so as to make his ambition impossible to achieve. So we need long-range precision fires in key locations. What Ukraine has also taught us is that we can quickly expend those fires so they need to be stockpiled and pre-positioned. And right now we're just not doing that stockpiles of long-range missiles. He points out they'd be under the sovereign control of Australia, but still, this is a big step beyond where we're, what, 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 what we're talking about in Australia. Yeah, absolutely, and not quite on that, you know, de-escalation when it comes to a lot of the repairs we're trying to do, particularly with certain regional neighbours and trying to make sure that relationship is a, a lot better. It's definitely, I think, something that will be talked about <clears throat> in the US in terms of that particular relationship. I think also... Um, he was talking about the need for Australia to really do its part. This is something that's always part of the conversation is how much we rely on our you know, great and powerful ally, the US, but what did they expect in return, right? And what can we do in the region? And it's these sorts of conversations, those sorts of prospects of basing weapons and doing things like that that are going to become more and more pointy mm. in the coming years as we just keep seeing this geopolitical tension. And hard for a, like old hardcore lefty like Anthony Albanese, even though obviously he's moderated his views on many things, um, to be the Prime Minister that Allows negotiates that. an escalation yeah. of military presence. Absolutely. Well, he's done the deal on nuclear right? submarines, mm -hmm. uh, so who knows what's next. We know the Labor Party National Conference is coming up uh, towards the end of this week and we're expecting a, a, a fair bit of debate on nuclear submarines. Except 
Except I think it's quite interesting that in the last couple of days the American-Australian leadership dialogue has been held in, in Canberra. Mm. We've had people like Mike Gallagher come out. A lot of other Americans are here as well. So it's a very high, high level meeting that's tightening the connections around AUKUS. And within Labor, the opponents of the AUKUS agreement or those who want to raise questions about it are still fairly muted. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't see anybody sort of take to the podium in the last couple of days while the leadership dialogue was on in Canberra. They're, they're keeping their powder dry until Labor co uh, conference, perhaps. But also, it's not clear to me who's actually going to speak up no. and lead that conference. fight and really annoy Anthony Albanese. Well, it's going to be controlled, right? We know nothing's going to stop the, the government going ahead with this now. One of the other issues uh, or uh, things that was addressed leading up to this conference was the Israel-Palestine question. The government's now adopted uh, new language or reverted to old language, if you like, uh, uh, that describes the, the territories as occupied Palestinian territories mm. and refers to the settlements as I illegal Israeli settlements. David, why has that happened now, this change? It ha it's happened now because we've got the Labor conference coming up and we know that this kind of thing does get aired on the Labor conference floor. So this is a, an outcome that could potentially diffuse some angry debate at the conference. It might embarrass Penny Wong as Foreign Minister or Anthony Albanese as Prime Minister, but I also think it's important to see it in terms of a long-term continuum. Mm. We know that within Labor, over many years, there's been this concern about Israel and this, this uh, group, including Bob Carr, former Premier of New South Wales, who wanted a different outcome, something that's more pro-Palestine, basically. Mm. Now, this outcome does not go all that way. And Anthony Albanese well, doesn't is staying, Palestine doesn't recognise Palestine. Anthony Albanese says we're still a strong friend of Israel. Mm. But this has raised you know, serious concerns among those so many supporters of Israel in Australia. And it is an interesting point, particularly given that they, they broke with mm. Scott Morrison's position mm. of recognising um, West Jerusalem, Jerusalem yeah, as, as the, the capital. capital. Just so a quick, there's been a shift over yeah. time. Just a final one, quickly. A nuclear waste dump, the search is back on uh, after the government confirmed it's not going to appeal a federal court ruling on the um, uh, Kimber site mm. in South Australia on the Air Peninsula there, uh, the ruling that um, knocked out that, that as, a, as a site. Um, Sarah, where does this go now? This um, has been a long time looking for a It has been facility. a long time, and I think that particular decision by the federal court surprised some within the government. I'm not sure that's exactly the outcome that they all predicted. And also it was that thing of it was because of the concerns of traditional owners. Mm. Now, in a year of a referendum of listening to Indigenous Australians, if you would appeal that court decision and I suppose not listen to traditional owners, that's very political, yeah. politically tricky. But now it's also being weaponised, of course, by the coalition, who's saying it's going to happen. Where to from here? Um, this is something that's going to take a really long time. Um, hopefully the government's going to have a new plan within 12 months, which is well, still got a pretty long find, lead time. They've got to find a, um, and, a facility for the submarine nuclear waste. Exactly. That's a Woomera. You're a South I'm Australian. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 everybody <laughs> always looks to us. The South <laughs> Australians are like, oh, God, all right, well, how much? And, you know, um, but, yeah, I think... like. The, the, the nuclear question is picking up steam again. The coalition, as David Littleproud just said, Peter Dutton has decided to really engage and looks like the, the coalition's um, policy for the next election will include yep. a commitment to nuclear. Now, I remember the last time that happened uh, um, when John Howard took this sort of, let's just be inquiring about nuclear. Let's How look at the go? options. And I remember... Kevin Rudd was just like, beauty. Mm. And every single campaign stop, he's like, where would the nuclear waste facility go in this electorate? Somehow, would it be, you know, and yeah. then he was Prime Minister. Somehow we ended up back on uh, Kevin Rudd. All right. Yeah. Uh, All uh, roads lead that way. Panel, <laughs> Annabelle Crabb, David Crow, and Sarah Eisen will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm a photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with photographer for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, Alex Ellinghausen, and a very warm welcome. Well, that was a huge week. The whole parliament seems to be uh, tied up with so much of uh, the debate about The Voice. Well, it's just question after question. Mm. There's, there's been a lot of questions on The Voice and this week it's been about 
He's been getting questions on treaty, Makarada, and even the document length. And you can tell that there is friction there. I saw the Prime Minister was very animated, in, and it shows in some of your photos mm -hmm. here. Is this real emotion? This was something that he referenced the day he became Prime Minister on election night. It's something that is close to him, he's passionate about. Linda Burney comes into question time as your photo shows here, and mm -hmm. she looks like she's carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders. Yeah, well, it's, there's almost a sense that uh, it almost feels like she's ready to, to tackle these questions. This is a beautiful Matt Golding, the yes and no campaigns. The yes person seems to have scratched out the fear, the voice, mm -hmm. and so it's ear the voice. It's, I thought that was very, very clever. Alex, he may not hold a hose, but he's certainly holding uh, a spot on the back benches. Every time you hear the words, uh, my question is to the Minister for Government Services, NDIS, you just, it's like the ding ding, Bill Shorten's about to get up and... Well, you know it's going to be a question related to uh, to Scott Morrison the and Commission. the handling of robo-debt. Mm. He sits there while Bill Shorten is giving these uh, quite punchy uh, responses to the Dorothy Dixer question mm -hmm. and he's he's muttering things under his breath. There does look to be a certain level of discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> he's got this look over the top of his glasses mm. thing which is just a classic you've mm. captured here beautifully. Mm. Alex this is a beautiful beautiful David Rowe he's got uh, called it fine tuning um, and the speaker Melton Dick is popping his head in through the door. Bill mm. the Greens were wondering if you'd be finished with Morrison yet. Soon, Milt, soon. Is and it, it looks like it's uh, Scott Morrison in the uh, coronavirus theme Hawaiian shirt, is it? Yeah, it's a ukulele. He's sort of tuning him up. They say that sport and politics don't mix, but uh, Mark Knight thinks he's got the answer to turning everyone's room from a pink to a uh, green and gold. What happened to your Barbie dolls in the pink decor? Oh, it's been Matilda Mania yeah. in Parliament House. We've seen everyone coming in with the scars. And the front of the building uh, had the illuminations, and that's to congratulate the diamonds as well. Yeah, that's right. The Prime Minister and the Minister... Uh, for, for aged care and sport, got mm -hmm. in on the act, mm -hmm. as did uh, Milton Dick. Yep. Talking about former Prime Ministers, uh, it was Kevin O'Heaven who was back in the building for the unveiling of his official portrait, and wasn't it great, <laughs> Alex, to see him? Well, you, you know how sometimes when you hear a song on a radio or you, you smell something familiar, it brings you back to that um, certain part of that time of your life. For us, it's former Prime Ministers. It felt so familiar but so strange, didn't it, when we were, I was photographing him because all the mannerisms you recognise, there's muscle memory there. Yeah, and there is. He had his portrait done and he chose uh, Ralph Hymans as yep. the author, who, who I must say did a really good job, mm -hmm. and um, it's included his cat, uh, Louis, and the artist actually had to say don't read anything political into the fact that there's a cat. It's just the cat wouldn't leave us alone when we were having it painted. Well, they were mentioning it might be the first time that an animal is in uh, one of the uh, former Prime Minister portraits. It would be just lovely with these portraits where they're hung downstairs if there was a little button you could press, Alex, and they could say sort of, you know, things, little ru little ruddisms, you know, like program. you press the button and it says programmatic specificity. Oh, fair shake of the sauce pot. Oh my God, I think that's the last thing the public needs. <laughs> well, Alex, it's been a great pleasure. I think uh, I'll let you do the honours. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. And we got a zip, so back to you, David. Very good, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mike. Time for some final observations. Very quick one from me. Some eyebrows raised amongst New South Wales Liberals after Bran Black was appointed the new head of the Business Council of Australia, the new chief executive. He's a former chief of staff to Dominic Perrottet, the former premier, and apparently Perrottet was approached for the job as well. There you go. Sarah? Um, I've been told I'm a bit obsessed with National Conference, but that's OK. I'll lean right in. I'm very interested to see what happens Thursday, Friday, Saturday beyond the Israel-Palestine um, change of language. There's also been other little bits and pieces that have been seen as an appeasement to the left, like Don Farrell announcing this week that there'll be frameworks or a parliamentary inquiry looking into frameworks for free trade agreements, which unions and the left have always been a bit concerned about. So you're seeing this real effort to control, uh, you know, particularly the left and make sure it's as an uneventful... It could be boring. It could, I'm worried about it being quite boring, exactly. David. We know, we touched on the voice earlier, we know that the pressure's on the Yes campaign to really win this when the referendum comes, probably in October, given the Washington visit for the Prime Minister. But it's, it's very important that the New South Wales Liberal leader, opposition leader Mark Speakman, former Attorney General of that state, came out in support of The Voice this week. He says, my view is that it's an enhancement of Liberal democracy. It doesn't detract from Liberal demo democracy. It's not a third chamber. It's listening and it's consulting. And I think we are going to be able... You know, it's important to watch these important mm. uh, figures stake their position on The Voice as we get closer to it.
Annabelle. division in the New South Wales Liberal Party. Oh. <laughs> um, I've already warned David that I'm sharking this uh, prediction slot to talk about <laughs> Kitchen Cabinet, which is coming back on Good. Tuesday night after a seven-year hiatus. Wow. This new parliament is the most diverse ever, and so we're starting with Di Lee, who won um, the seat of Fowler in sensational circumstances. She has the most remarkable pre-politics life story I've ever heard and she's also a great cook. But the first episodes, the first four episodes of this show, the first one's Di Lee, second is Peter Dutton, third is uh, Linda Burney and the fourth is Lydia Thorpe and there are a lot of surprises and reveals in Ooh. those shows. Cannot Action wait. Packed. Cannot Ooh. wait. All right, Tuesday night. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, on his return to Parliament House, Kevin Rudd joked about the fact that he wasn't always the easiest to work with as Prime Minister. Funny, because it was true, according to one former Cabinet colleague I was watching along with. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Two members of my staff, past and present, all 4,602 of them. Uh, you can tell them because they're the ones who are exhibiting PS PTSD today. Uh, some of them still are carrying wounds. The, uh, lovely to see you all, uh, and, uh, and there is a therapy tent for you over there for later on. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.